Our scripture reading comes from Galatians 3. For in Christ Jesus, you are all made sons of God through faith. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Let's pray. God, as we worship together this morning as a church, as your church, I pray that we will be reminded of that, that we are all one in you because of what you did for us. And God, I pray that that will make an impact in our lives. God, I pray that our desire will be completely for you, that we will anchor ourselves to nobody or nothing but you because you're worthy of it, you're deserving of it because you created us, you sent your son to die for us, to save us for something that we couldn't do ourselves, God. I pray that you will remind us of that. Let us be mindful of that. God, we love you. We love you for who you are. We love you for what you've done. We love you more than anything. In your name I pray. Amen. Kids, you are dismissed to Children's Church. Good morning, church family. Go ahead and open your Bibles to Colossians. Last week, we ended our declutter series, and now we're going to go verse by verse through the letter to the church at Colossae. Five years ago, uh, I came about this time and preached in View of Call weekend to be your pastor. And I preached on Colossians 1, 15 through 23. And while I'm not preaching Colossians 1, 15 through 23, I will be in the next couple of weeks. I think after five years, I'm just again reminded the same sermon that I preached five years ago, I, same, same sermon and same truth is, is true today, that Christ is enough, that he is enough. Five years ago, I never imagined COVID or all the, other, all the things this world threw at us. But even today, still, Christ is enough. I mean, church, he is sufficient. He is sufficient for salvation, and he is sufficient for sanctification. He is enough. No matter what we're going through in this life, he is enough, and he is good, and he is faithful. And that's what we sung about this morning, that he is good and that he is faithful. Well, as we are going to study through the book of Colossians, let's understand a few things about the church here. This is written by Paul. Uh, Paul led a man to the Lord named Epaphras. Epaphras came to know the Lord. He was a Gentile. And upon coming to know the Lord, he journeys back to his hometown in Colossae. And he begins to proclaim the gospel. He begins to proclaim the good news of Jesus. Well, people became believers. And the church was planted and born right there in Colossae. It's pretty awesome. Isn't it amazing? He goes back. he, He tells the good news of Jesus. And people believe. And this church is full of baby believers. Believers who are are Jewish and believers who are Gentiles. And through them growing in the Lord, they they struggled sometimes. They struggled with sometimes bringing in Jewish legalism or or Gentile mysticism. some, Some spiritualism or Gnosticism they would try to bring in. 
But Epaphras would continue to teach them the truths of Scripture. He would continue to proclaim to them the truths of Scripture. And this is what we see here. We see Epaphras journeying, making a journey back to Paul. All right? Paul and telling him about the church at Colossae. And Paul, in all that he heard, he's going to write a letter back. After hearing about what Epaphras said about this body of believers, these, these believers that he loves. We're going to hear what he has to say about them. It's pretty, pretty interesting, right? Let's look at Colossians chapter 1, starting with verse 1. Listen to what he says about these group of believers. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Listen to what he says here. To the saints and faithful brothers in Christ at Colossae, grace to you and peace from God our fathers. Verse 3, we always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. Man, how encouraging is that? Like Paul, the Apostle Paul, in verse 2, says to the saints and faithful brothers. And he says, we have prayed for you since we heard of verse 4 of your faith. He calls them faithful and he says that he has heard of their faith. I mean, this is a pretty special way that this letter begins here. It's a pretty special way as he proclaims to, and somewhat baby believers, I have heard of your faithfulness. I've heard of it. And so I'm writing to you who are faithful. Now, were these body of believers perfect? No. Were they struggling with, with Jewish legalism and Gentile mysticism? Yes. And as I read this and, and knowing that, yes, I've been your lead pastor for five years, but I was here as the youth pastor for eight years. So I've been here a total of 13 years. 13 years, and as I was studying this and thinking back on it, I thought about being 23 and becoming your youth pastor. I thought about that. 23 years old, not having any, any kids, and so the youth group became me and my wife's kids. Thanks, parents, for sharing. Right? And I, I remember watching them grow in the Lord. I remember being there in their, in their hardest days, in the days they were broken, and in the days that they were struggling, and, and also being there for the greatest moments in their life up until that point. And I remember celebrating that with them. I remember crying with them. I remember praying with them. And, and once a year, I would write their name on a sheet of paper, and we would go around. We caught it like a hot seat moment. We would go around, and we would, we would write ways that we saw Christ in their life. And I remember, I remember we would go around as a youth group in right ways that we saw Christ in each other's life. Not that we were perfect. Not that they were perfect, but, but moments where we were proud of them. Moments where we wanted to affirm what God was doing in their life. And I remember writing that out. And I remember those students would read it. And many of them would cry. And they would take it back to their room. And they were encouraged by what people saw in their life. I mean, it's so beautiful when a body of, believer, body of believers affirm one another. I mean, I am very appreciative when people see Christ in my life. And this is what Paul's saying here to this church at Colossae. You're not perfect. No, you're not perfect. But I'm proud of your faithfulness. I've heard of your faith. I mean, how wonderful is that? How wonderful is that to, for the Apostle Paul to call that out in their life? And so the body of believers at Colossae were affirmed. That's the first point I want you to get. They were affirmed. And I think it's a big deal for us as believers to affirm one another. You know, those same, those same youth, you know, they're getting older now. I'm, I'm 30, almost 39. I've got some gray hair. They remind me of that. Okay. But you know, they're older now. And, and now not only have I seen them grow as teenagers, but now I'm seeing them grow as husbands and wives. I've seen them have their own family. I'm seeing them disciple their own family. You know I'm still proud of them. And if you're in here, you know I'm still proud of you. I'm still proud of what God is doing in your life. And no, I don't think you're perfect, and I'm not either. But I'm seeing you disciple your kids. I'm seeing you love your wife. I'm seeing you love your husband. I'm seeing you serve the church. I see that. And I'm thankful for what God is doing in your life. And church, that's what it looks like to be a part of a family, faith family. 
That's what it looks like to do life with one another, to see one another grow in the Lord and to call that out and to affirm that in each other's life. I see it. You know, the same group, there's been times where, where I've, I've, I've pulled them into a room and I've called out sin in their life. And you know how they've responded? Hey, you're right. I'll say, Jesus is better. And they go, yep, you're right. Jesus is better. So I've walked with them in the moments where we've had to call out sin in their life. And I've walked with them in the moments where I've seen Jesus triumphant in their life. Seen them flourish. And guys, that's what it looks like to be a part of a body of believers. God never called us to walk alone. He called us to do this together, to strive together, to to stir one another on for good works, for the glory of God. And that's what it should look like. And so I'm so thankful to be walking this life with you. I'm so thankful that five years, man, I've seen God work in your life. And I'm so thankful for that. I've seen it. And we're not perfect by no means. We've got a ways to go, sure. But I'm thankful And I hope that you are thankful also for what God's doing in your life. But on top of that, we see Paul affirming these group of believers. And I'm sure them reading that, they're thinking, man, Paul's in prison. Man, like, like he's doing what he can. He's suffering for the glory of God, and he's proud of us. Man, I'm sure that encouraged them. And so let's put that in some application then. If Paul does that, right, and we are encouraged when people affirm our, us. And we see Paul affirming the church at Colossae, even though they've got some things going on. Let me ask you the question, who are you affirming? I mean, who are you reminding that they have been growing in the Lord and, and, and telling them when they are faithful? Who are you affirming in the faith? Like, is it your kids? Are you, are you calling out when you, when you see your kids, like you're calling out good things in their life? It's easy to correct, right? But what happens when you see God move in their life? Man, do you affirm that? Do you affirm when they kill sin? Do you affirm when you see fruit in their life? Man, we should be. We should be. What about, what about uh, your spouse? Right? It's easy to, to call out sin in our spouse, even though we know they're a sinner, right? If you have an expectation for your spouse to be perfect... Let me bust that bubble. Pow. All right. Like they're not perfect, right? So we should be affirming when they are growing in the Lord and when they're killing sin in their life. They have sin. We all have sin, right? That's okay. Right? We want to kill that sin. We want to put it to death, but, but we all have it. And, and it's good, right? When we grow in the Lord and we are faithful to the Lord. And so let's affirm that. What about the person that you're mentoring? Man, who, what about your neighbor or your friend or your inner circle? Man, who, who are the people that you are affirming? Who are the people that you are telling them you're proud of them and you're seeing God move in their life? Who? And if you say no one, then man, let's repent of that. Let's be people who are energy givers and not energy takers. You know, there's some people we hang around. Uh, when, you, when you hang around them, you think, man, I just feel better. Like, I feel better about my walk with the Lord. I feel better about being a husband. I feel better about being a wife. I feel better about being a dad. I feel better about being a mom. You know those people? Man, they're energy givers. Like, you're around them and you feel closer to the Lord. Brother Danny's that type of guy. Like, when I hang around him, I feel closer to the Lord. Right? What about you, man? And who are those people in your life? And then, can you be that in someone else's life? Could you be someone like a Paul who's talking to a group of young believers and saying, I've heard of your faith. I'm writing to all the saints, all the faithful, right? To the saints and faithful brothers, brothers and sisters in Christ. I'm, I'm writing to them. And how encouraged that. Could we be those people? Could we be the people that affirm others? Not only does, the, does he call out you know, godliness in their life and affirmed them, as we see. He goes on and says this, look at verse 3 again. We always thank God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you. So, so he prays for them, right? And so look at verse 9. And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding 
so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. So he's praying for the group of believers. He is praying and thankful for what he has seen in their lives. So not only should we be people who affirm others, right, in their, in Christ, but we should also be people who pray over others. We should be people who are thankful and prayerful of what we've seen and heard in their life. And so let's ask this, who have you prayed over? Who are you praying for? Like, are you a safe place for your children? Like, hear that. Are you a safe place where they can come to you and you will pray over them, pray over their godliness, pray over that they'll walk in a manner worthy of the gospel? What about your friends? Are you a safe place for them to be prayed for? As you guys are casting all of your cares at the feet of Jesus, can they voice those concerns to you and knowing that you are going to pray over them and pray for them? Because Paul, man, he's struggling, he's in prison, and he's affirming other people, and he is crying out to God on their behalf. He's crying out to God. He is praying for them. And I love that. I love his heart here, a heart that loves God and loves others, loves others enough to call out godliness in their life and, and to pray for them. So how are you praying for your kids? How are you praying for your spouse? How are you praying for the ones you're mentoring? How are you praying for the ones that you're investing into? How, how are you praying for them? Do you care? Because if you care for them, you pray for them. There's a book, I've mentioned it multiple times that I've preached. It's called A Praying Life by Paul Miller. It changed my prayer life. And he has this simple practice. You get an index card and you write a name on an index card. And as you write his name, say it's my kid's name or it's maybe your name or it's my wife's name, whatever. And then I give them the index card. And I don't do it every week or every month, but I do it often, right? That I'll give them a card and I will say, hey, write down what's going on in your life. And I'm going to write verses and I'm going to pray over that. I'm going to pray for you. And in praying for you, I'm going to ask you, man, how are you doing? Right? I'm not correcting you. I'm not judging you. I'm just going to ask, how are you doing? Are there anything else I can pray for? Sometimes I know what's going on in their life, right? And I just write things down on their index card. And I say, hey, this is what I'm praying for. Recently, we, we, we wrote everything out, right, on index card. My kids wrote it out. And then they shared it with one another. And they prayed for each other on their prayer card. They prayed because they, they want, I need to teach them to pray for people, pray over what people's going through in their life. It's a healthy practice for you. And pray for them. I know you've got friends that are going through times, going through things in their life. Maybe your spouse, maybe your kids, man, pray for them. Cry out to God. What a friendship it is, or what a relationship it is when your wife, when your kids, when your friends, they can come to you knowing that you're going to call out godliness in their life. You're going to affirm where you see faithfulness in their life. And you're going to pray for them when they are broken and when they're hurting. Or even when they're doing well, you're praying for them. I am so thankful for my friends who not only tell me they're praying for me, but pray over me. I have been there and they have cried out to God for me. Some of that relationship I had with the students, and now that they're adults, man, we have that relationship because they have shared where they're in their deepest pain, and we've prayed together. Because that's what it looks like to be a part of a faith family. That's what it looks like to be a part of the bride of Christ. We're not alone. We're in this together. And Paul, even though he is in prison, man, he... He's crying out for other people because they're in it together and they're probably crying out to God for him. That's a beautiful thing, church. It's a beautiful thing. Well, at our dinner table in my family, we call it dinner table conversations, right? And so, you know, other people, you, you have people over at your house, man, that's all good. But a dinner table, that's kind of an intimate setting, right? You know, it's kind of like family devotion time, right? It's just, just this intimate setting. And and, and during this family dinner, we'll, we'll ask sometimes, man, where's your high, where's your low? What's going on in your life, right? What's your high, what's your low? What, and, and during that time, they get to share their high and their low. And, and then we get to call out, like, hey, I've seen this in your life. Or, you know, we have a hot seat moment where, hey, I've seen this in your life. I've seen God moving in this in your life. And we get to encourage one another. What's well, important to do those things, it's important to affirm, it's important to pray. So I want to take a little dinner table conversation right now, me and you. 
I was here as your youth pastor for eight years. I've been back as your lead pastor for five. Thirteen years. I want you to hear this, church. Over 13 years, I have watched you kill sin in your life. I've watched you grow in the Lord. I've watched you restore relationships and marriages. I've watched you give faithfully. I've watched you disciple your kids. I've watched you serve in the next generation student ministry and youth ministry. I've watched you faithfully give so that we don't have any debt. I've watched you give so that we can church plant churches and and help orphanages and sponsor kids and give to foster care closets even today and, and baby bottles that's walk for life. I mean, I have watched God move in your life. And church, hear this. And I'm proud of you. And I'm thankful for you. And I am continuing to pray for your godliness and you continue to walk in a manner worthy of the gospel. I pray that you continue to be a light in this community. I've said before, I want to pastor a church that if God removed that church for the, from the community, the community would suffer because we're, you're, the church is present, helping with food and clothes and presenting the gospel and building into the next generation. And church, I am proud that you are that church. Are you perfect? No. And I don't expect you to be. But I'm proud of your faithfulness. I'm proud of where I see God moving in your life. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for how you've killed sin. I'm thankful for how we're doing missions. I'm thankful for how we've baptized seven this far, and we've got eight to ten more to baptize of of God using this faith family to promote the gospel to this lost and dying world. I am am proud of your faithfulness. And church, that's that's what we should be doing, affirming one another and and praying for one another. And so I hope that you will find people, even this week, to affirm and to pray for. I hope that you're that for one another, that you encourage one another. I told the first service, we we ended the first service, we got to walk down that hallway and grab donuts if you got there in time, right? We're going to have to increase our number, which I'll try to do, and grab some coffee if you got there in time. Got to make more, which we talked about. But I said, man, I would love for that to be an area where you're encouraging one another, praying for, just stop and pray for one another. Tell each other where you're seeing Christ move. Man, how wonderful would that be to see the Holy Spirit just move in that way, to spur one another on to good works. As a church, I'm thankful to be your pastor, one of your elders. I'm thankful, and I pray that God continues to use us. Not only do we see Paul affirming, and not only do we see Paul praying for, but listen to what else Paul says here. He says this in verse 5, because, so he's heard about all this, but listen, because of the hope laid up in heaven, of this you have heard before the word of truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed the whole world, it is bearing fruit and increasing. Okay, so the gospel came to them and it is bearing fruit and increasing. And listen to what he says here. I love this. As it also does among you. The gospel is increasing among you. Man, that's encouraging, right? Listen to what he says. As it does among you, since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God, just as you learned it from Epaphras. Just as you heard it, understood it, and learned it from Epaphras. And listen to how it describes Epaphras here. Our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. And has made known to us your love in the Spirit. Listen to how he's described. As someone who is a faithful servant, a a, a faithful minister, someone that's for you, for the church. And in being for the church, you know what he did? He, He told them the gospel. He helped them understand the gospel through the Holy Spirit. And he he helped them learn the truths of the gospel. And so this faith family not only are being affirmed. Not only are they being prayed for, but they are being equipped for the Great Commission. Equipped for the Great Commission. And I thought, man, what an out, like what a recipe for a godly church. Affirmed, prayed for, equipped. 
equipped. That they are hearing the truths of gospel, they're, they're learning the truths of the gospel, they're, they're putting to death sin, they're, they're growing in their faithfulness, they're, they're encouraging one another. I mean, what a, a recipe for a great church for the glory of God. Church who, who heard the truth, understood the truth, and are continuing to learn the truth. Well, let me ask you this. Where did you first hear the truth of the gospel? Who was it? Who was it that first told you the truth of the gospel? Who helped you to understand the truth of the gospel? Anyone? Like, name? Have you somebody told you, right? It just happened, right? You had to learn it from somebody. So you heard it from somebody, you understood it from somebody, and then you started learning the truth from somebody. You got that name? Someone that, that taught you, that helped you learn it, that, that told you the truth of the gospel, that, that modeled it in your life. You, you remember that name? I do. You remember those names? Maybe it's multiple names. The person that, that you heard it from, that, that taught it to you, that helped you learn those truths. You heard it? You got it? Why can't you be that name? Like, you, you got that name in your life, right? Are you that name in someone else's life? Are you that name? Are you the one that they, they heard the truth from? Are you the one that they, they learned the truth of the gospel from? Are you the one that, that are teaching or have taught them the truth of the gospel? College student, somebody told you. Somebody built into you. Who are you building into? Who are you teaching? Who are you mentoring? Somebody did a Bible study with you. Somebody poured into you. Who are you doing that for? You know, some of my greatest joys in, in college ministry and student ministry is we'd pray together. We would, we would do Bible study together. Yes. You know what we'd also do? We'd also shoot basketball together. We'd also talk trash to each other. It's a great time. Some of my greatest memories, right, of, of just doing life. And in doing life... Sometimes you get these moments to, to just be real with one another and say, Jesus is enough. He's enough for you and he's enough for me. And so I'm asking you, who are you doing life with that you get to, to let them hear the gospel and you get to show them the gospel and teach them the gospel? Because that's how Epaphras is described. He's only described a few areas in Scripture. He spent some time in prison with Paul. That's it. He's only described as, people, as someone who was a faithful minister, a fellow servant, someone who cared so much about a group of people that he made a journey to see Paul. He made a journey to see Paul to tell them about the group of people, how, what they're doing well and what they're struggling with. I mean, that's somebody that cares, isn't it? Somebody that teaches the truth and affirms them and prays for them and is so burdened for their life that he makes a journey to go see Paul and even spends time in prison because he loves a group of people. In church, we're called to love people that way. We're called to affirm people in the gospel. We're called to pray for people and be burdened for them when they're hurting and to be the people who tell the truths of the gospel. So who are you? Man, who are you? Like, who, Whose person are you? That when they are struggling or when they need encouragement or when they need affirmation or they need to be prayed for or they need to be reminded of the truths of the gospel, do they come to you? Be those people. One of my best friends, he, he shares with me his, his deepest issues, his brokenness. He also, even yesterday, he texted me, uh, his, his kid hit a game-winning shot. Sent me the video. His kid hit a game-winning shot. And he said, proud dad moment. And I, I bring that up to say, you can only do things like that with a small group of people because other people think you're bragging. Right? But when he sent it to me, it wasn't, it wasn't bragging. It was just him sharing a proud moment he had in his life of his kid. Whew, to have more of that, 
safe conversation. That's not judgmental. That's not considered someone bragging or entitled. But just to have moments with people where you're authentic moments of affirmation and prayer and gospel truth. Where you can just share your highs and your lows and what's going on in your life and to know that people really care. Wouldn't it be beautiful? Shouldn't our kids have that? Shouldn't our spouses have that? Shouldn't our friends have that? Shouldn't we, as a body of believers, it may not be true of all of us together, but in certain groups within this body, shouldn't that be true? If you're walking this life on your own, man, you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. If you're, if you're thinking everybody should be perfect, man, again, quit believing that. Quit believing that. Like, do life with people. I love doing lunches with my friends and sharing common things with my friends and going out with our families. Why? Yes, to spend time together, but, man, also to, to sharpen one another to laugh together, to aggravate one another, to do life together, to share our highs and our lows. Why? Because through Christ, we need one another. And this is what we see here. A church at Colossae, a group of baby believers, struggling with Gentile legalism and, or Jewish legalism and Gentile mysticism, but are still encouraged, still prayed for, still taught, still loved. So church, I'm blessed to be a part of your life. I'm blessed to teach you the truth. I'm also blessed that you are teaching my children the truth. That you're reflecting Christ to them. One of my, child, my children said, one of my kids said, multiple times, she goes, Dad, if church feels like a family, 650 people, she says, feels like a family. That's wonderful, church. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. We're not perfect. But let's continue to strive to be faithful. Let's encourage one another. Let's pray for one another. Let's teach the truths of Scripture. Why? Because Christ is enough. He's everything to us. He's everything. He is sufficient. He is sufficient enough for salvation. He is sufficient enough for sanctification. He is sufficient enough. He is everything we need. And sometimes we need to be reminded from people of who Christ is. So church, this altar is open. Maybe you'll come and, and pray for your church. First service, we had people pray. Thankful to be a part of a family of God. Maybe you need to come up here and ask, who can you affirm? Who can you pray over? Who can you teach? Who can you mentor? Maybe you need to pray and ask God to help you to have a conversation with your kids and, and have a safe place for them. However, I mean, cast all of your cares at God's feet. He's enough. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for your love and your mercy. Thank you that in your sovereignty you have placed us here as a body of believers. And I'm so encouraged by how Paul and Epaphras loved a body of believers. A body of believers that are not perfect, God, but, but, but that are saved. They're part of the bride of Christ. And I hope that we will be people who will invite others outside of this community to be a part of the bride of Christ. I hope that, that we inform others outside of this church. Right, God, that, that there's 35 to 40,000 people around us. And many don't know the gospel. And so help them to know that this is a church that is a hospital for sinners. That this is a church where we're not perfect. We're not, we're not people that should be entitled. We're not those people, God. We're people who are lost and hopeless, but are now saved and redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus. So help us to inform people all around us of who God is. Just to encourage others. God, we love you. I pray you'll lay people on our heart today. It's in Jesus' name we pray.